The British task force continues to sail south, preparing for battle if all else fails. Alexander Haig's been talking all day in Buenos Aires, but the outcome's far from clear. Distressed Falkland Islanders plead for help from Britain. You know, for Christ's sake, somebody out there, do something. Something, anything. The Queen gives Canada back her constitution. And Princess Anne runs into trouble in the badminton horse trials. Changes of mood and changes of plan have marked today's diplomatic round in Buenos Aires, where the American Secretary of State has been holding crucial talks with the Argentine leaders about the Falklands crisis. At one stage, Mr. Haig's departure for London appeared imminent, and that aroused cautious optimism. Then came gloom as more talks were held, and now it seems he may be going straight to Washington instead of coming to London. Michael Burke's been following events in Buenos Aires. When Mr. Haig left his hotel in Buenos Aires this morning, his negotiations had appeared to be almost over. There was no official word of the terms of the settlement he's been putting to the Argentine government, but it's thought here they include the withdrawal of both sides' armed forces, joint civilian administration of the Falklands, and eventual transfer of sovereignty to Argentina. It looked as though he would soon be on his way to London. Mr. Haig's plane has been standing here at the airport since early this morning, waiting to take him to London when and if the Argentine government agrees to his new peace proposals. That agreement appeared to have been almost reached late last night. The American party's bags were loaded onto the plane as Mr. Haig paid a last courtesy call on the Argentine president, General Galtieri. But it wasn't to be as simple as that. As the negotiations became bogged down again, additional flight plans were filed for the plane. If there was no agreement to take to London, he would return to Washington or go to Venezuela to await developments. It was the Argentine foreign minister, Mr. Costa Mendes, who warned Mr. Haig today that agreement would not be as easy as both men had thought. Mr. Haig went to see the president, General Galtieri, a repeat of their meeting yesterday. This time, the president had discussed the proposals with the rest of the junta and with all the army generals. The sticking point was any concession at all over sovereignty. It's said here that Mr. Haig has been blunt with the Argentines, pointing out the proposals of the last chance for peace, that he needs an answer one way or the other. The talks still go on. Agreement, according to one government source, is possible. The confusion and uncertainty emanating from Buenos Aires is reflected in London tonight. Mrs Thatcher returned unexpectedly from Chequers two hours ago and was joined at number 10 by Mr Francis Pym, the Foreign Secretary, and the Deputy Prime Minister, William Whitelaw. They're still there, and I understand that within the last hour they've received indications that Mr Haig will not be coming to London from Buenos Aires, but will be flying straight to Washington. What isn't clear is the significance of that. Does it mean the peace mission has failed? Or could it be that Mr. Haig is going to Washington to tell President Reagan he's achieved something and allow the president to announce it? The occupants of Downing Street are amongst those trying to clarify the situation. All the spokesman there will say is that they have not been in direct touch with Mr. Haig since he left here on Tuesday. The message he took with him then was quite clear. All things are, as they have always been, negotiable, but not until Argentine forces have pulled out and British administration has been restored. Unless the Argentines are prepared to accept that, there is no point in you coming back, was the polite but firm message Mr Haig took with him. Well, at that point, Mr Haig went to Washington for a rethink with President Reagan about the fence-sitting policy, spurred on, no doubt, by the increasingly hostile reaction in the United States to what Mr Reagan himself called his even-handedness. And so Mr Haig has been putting the screws on the Argentines. The problem is that there's very little point in President Galtieri giving way if it also brings him down, which is why Mr Haig's departure from Buenos Aires has been on and off with a dizzying frequency during the day, and why what are described as grim-faced junta generals have been rushing around Buenos Aires, consulting with each other. The British Naval Task Force is now well south of Ascension Island. Our reporter, Brian Hanrahan, and a camera crew are with them aboard HMS Hermes. They've been watching preparations for any possible action, including the arrival of the force commander, Rear Admiral Sandy Woodward. Later in the programme, we'll have a full report from the fleet. 
More Argentine warships have also put to sea. They've been slipping out of the harbour at Buenos Aires over the past few days, but that's thought to be more a morale-boosting exercise. Supply ships have been seen leaving Puerto Belgrano, about 350 miles south of Buenos Aires. The first independent film report from the occupied Falklands, not shot by Argentine invaders or their friends, has now reached us. It was made by an American NBC crew and taken to Buenos Aires. Christopher Morris reports from there. This is the air bridge from the mainland to the Falklands, how Argentina is able to beat the Royal Navy's blockade of the islands. Port Stanley's airport hasn't even had to be extended for the huge airlift now going on. As many as 100 flights a day are bringing in reinforcements, arms, ammunition and supplies as the British task force approaches. The air bridge is vital and Britain knows it, warning that the blockade will soon be extended to include Falklands airspace too. The military commander though is concerned about how the British residents are reacting to the occupation forces. The people of the island uh, uh, is uh, now uh, I think a little afraid in order uh, if it will be military operation here and uh, we have no many time to, to speak with the people. Along the road from the airport, there's an almost constant stream of soldiers marching to take up defensive positions in and around Port Stanley. And in the island's capital, troops have taken over houses left empty by British residents who fled into the countryside. For those who've stayed behind, even walking down the street is a nerve-wracking experience. I just don't like it. Do you feel like a hostage here? Well, more or less that. Because there's not much we can do. You're not allowed to go out of the town. Or even go into your home up on the hill there without all their authority or authorization and all the rest. Have they told you you can't leave the town? They haven't said we can't leave, no. But it's very difficult to leave. Would you like to leave and, and no, get out of the islands? Well, if uh, we were all taken out of it, yes. But otherwise, no. Only about 300 of Port Stanley's residents now remain. The other 700 have fled to remote farming settlements seeking refuge. The streets now are practically deserted, apart from the soldiers, of course. Over 10,000 of them now on the island, their guns at the ready, a bewildering sight for the Britons who are now effectively hostages. <coughs> we were supposed to carry on as normal. Mm -hmm. Right? These arrows show suddenly you've got to change the way you run your traffic. Mm. How can you carry on as normal? It's ridiculous. The people here don't want Argentine rule. The minister of the Anglican Church says the island's now an armed fortress. As you look around, you will see that there's troops on every corner, and these have been thinned out considerably in the last two weeks. But for at least two years, we've lived almost without a police force. The people here are not used to the sight of guns. And you can't talk to a person if he's poking a gun at you all the time. The only conversation we get from these people is a gesture with a gun. At the local supermarket, food supplies for the islanders are dwindling fast. There's been almost panic buying for English goods delivered before the invasion. But the only Union Jack left in Port Stanley remains unsold. No longer can children attend the local school. It's been taken over by a unit of Argentine commandos. Why did you decide uh, to walk out? Uh, we walked out because we could not hold school in the conditions that prevailed immediately after the, uh, after the invasion. We had military presence, especially outside the junior school, the infant school. We had tanks, we had soldiers in the yard. And uh, most of our school population were, were disappearing to the camp anyway, to the, to the countryside. I'm staying. I'm staying if it remains the Falklands, but not... not Argentina. I can't say anymore. It's, it makes me so angry. The, the old people are frightened. They're frightened. Some of them are frightened to go out of their homes. Um, they've been begging for food at the doors. And now I'm going to see if I can see Blue Marie, this is the chap in charge, to see if I can get something done about this old man's property. They're checking houses now to see who's left in them, who's not left in them. 
you know, for Christ's sake, somebody out there, do something. Something, anything. There's lots of us walking around with smiles, with letting them laugh, you know, trying to make ourselves laugh. Because we don't set panic into these people. Somebody wants to do something, even if it's a mass voluntary evacuation. And now for some of the day's other news. President Brezhnev has suggested a summit meeting with President Reagan this autumn. It amounts to a count. The bulk of the force, the best of the British Navy, is still heading south. At least 53 ships are involved overall, among them 15 warships and 26 others requisitioned by the government. Our reporter, Brian Hanrahan, is on the flagship HMS Hermes. This is his report of life on board during the first half of the voyage. HMS Hermes put to sea in haste. A crew scrambling back from leave, hundreds of tons of stores piled aboard. The first hours were crazy ones tidying up people and equipment, and then buckling down to building a fighting ship. The Navy had boarded every Harrier it had and scoured its ground stations for the pilots to fly them. Skilled combat pilots though they were, they needed first to recover the skill of operating on a moving deck at sea. The exercise also meshed the squadrons into the ship's system. They meet through the flight deck officer, Brightly clad in yellow jacket, he marshals the aircraft with the clarity of a mime artist. Trying to keep planes and people apart, Harriers and helicopters airborne simultaneously. Constant drills day and night sharpen reaction, squeezing minutes off response times. The damage control center, HQ1, monitors the time taken to seal up the ship against attack. Experienced petty officers instruct young seamen in the unchanging routines of shoring up bulkheads against leaks. Slip them in the top there, on the pad piece. Good defense, we were told, can save the ship, even if it's hit. In flight control, as everywhere on the ship, asbestos masks and gloves are worn to protect against the flash of fire or explosion. But the direction of the flight deck continues as the crew learn to go on, increasing in efficiency despite the cumbersome precautions. As the ship turns steadily south, a bustling island on an empty sea, the crew becomes more thoughtful. The news reaching us from home suggests that war is becoming thinkable and Hermes, the flagship of the fleet, will be a primary target. There's a real chance that all this drill and practice will be needed. This is no longer a game. Today is Easter Sunday and after the rigours of the past week, the captain has decided it's time to maintain his men rather than his machinery. Sunshine and exercise is the prescription, so for the day flying has been stopped and the flight deck turned over to the crew for a garden party. For a few hours, the loudest noise to disturb the sunbathers were the cheers of the sports supporters. It was a holiday, not just from work, but from the cramped quarters below. To be given the run of the flight deck was luxury to men who had just a few feet to call their own in quarters they must share with scores of others. But despite the overcrowding, with all the extra marines and air crew squeezed in, some people managed to produce fancy dress. There was an American general, even an Argentine spy. A hamburger stall did a roaring trade, with a very happy leading cook helping out. My missus had a little boy last night, uh, five past eleven, little boy, call him Peter. Five times you, mean, you, think, you think she's going to call him Peter? I know he's going to call him Peter, she better call him Peter. <laughs> In this more relaxed atmosphere, I talked to some of the crew. We're all hope and we're all missing our families and all that. You know, because some of us have not been home uh, for since yeah. Christmas. There's quite a lot of that, and we were looking forward to leaving that. Slightly apprehensive at times, but uh, we believe in what we're going down to do. So uh, we think we'll handle the situation. Have you made any sort of private thoughts about, about it? Oh, maybe will out. That's what I mean. <laughs> you made a will out. Oh yeah. Mm. One of them things, isn't it? Mm. 
we've got to go. Don't really want to, but we've got to. Easter service conducted by the ship's chaplain, Roger Devonshire, also remembered the men's families. In his sermon, the Rev Dev, as he's called about ship, talked of achieving a victory, not over an enemy, but over each man's own fears and uncertainties. The finale of the afternoon was a beard auction. All beards will have to go so gas masks can fit properly. So I offered mine, along with others, for charity. Well, there it is, making light of a serious subject. And there could hardly be a better example of the way in which the ship is settling down to do whatever it is that it's asked to do when we get to the Falkland Islands. Easter Monday, and the Harriers are back on the hockey pitch. The pilots concentrate on combat. They go off, operationally drab, in flights five at a time to challenge each other. Up high in the skies, we see them battling, chasing each other's tails as they fight for the split-second advantage which could give them a kill. Fighting the Harrier is a complex business. It needs instinctive, intelligent reactions, instant coordination of radar, gun sights and controls. You have, said one pilot, to think like a train. Between the carriers, between the squadrons, between every pilot, there's rivalry. Invincible has one squadron, eight Harriers to the 12 on Hermes. They believe they're the best because they have to. They listen intently to their briefing. While the rest of the Navy fights as a coordinated team, they're the gladiators, off to single combat. Their lives depend directly on what they know and do. The fleet's all tuned up, ready to go. And uh, I find it very difficult to uh, do other than think Please, I'm going to uh, war, Corey, which is right. Two, three, I need to think that way, and I, my men need to think that way. This, I think that's the same that the captain has, and we're going to keep thinking that way until uh, it's all fizzled out or we actually go and uh, sort it out with military action. The Argentinians have much to be afeared of. They certainly have, yes. Invincible also houses 820 helicopter squadron with Prince Andrew as a co-pilot. Here's his helicopter lifting off. Riflemen and GPMG gunners, pick your weapons, all dressed back. All I want left here, 66, 84 men. With all the flying, the Marines aboard Hermes get only limited periods on deck. One of these they gave over to test firing of weapons from the stern. Fire. The first shot from a light anti-tank weapon won a round of applause. They went on to give a display to the ship's company. Their main anti-tank weapon, the Carl Gustav, was next. Even the cooks had a go with the spare one. All the other weapons which hadn't been tested recently were fired off together. Machine guns and SLRs in a clattering broadside. And the value of the morning was proved when they found one rifle that didn't work and needed replacing. This is just an operational test to make sure that every Marine knows his weapon can work. But it's doing wonders for the morale of the rest of the company to stand and watch their firepower being blasted off across the stern. The Marines' principal transport to war will be the jungly the nickname for the Navy officers in khaki, flying camouflaged helicopters. The helicopter gives the attacking force maximum flexibility. It doesn't even have to land. The commandos are trained to come down a rope, hand over hand, carrying a pack, a rifle at the ready. The helicopters whirled around the deck, preparing for every sort of landing. The carrier is only a small part of a modern fighting force, and carries only limited weapons. For its defence, it relies on its aircraft and escorting ships. 
In contrast, HMS Broadsword, one of the Navy's newest and biggest frigates, fairly bristles with missiles. She's our goalkeeper. She carries one of the world's most effective defence systems and operates close to the carrier to protect her. For several hours, the captains manoeuvred within a hundred yards of each other while the Marines practiced their assaults from the flight deck. With helicopters buzzing about, it required all the delicacy of the diplomatic dance going on between London and Buenos Aires. Neither ship nor aircraft used radio, so the whole complicated game was coordinated by all this lamp. Whether radio silence will help avoid detection is uncertain. Reports say Argentina is receiving information from the Soviet Union and Soviet spy planes have been watching us. I would imagine that they uh, are interested. They are interested in the Western fleets and what they're doing all the time. They have a costly and widely spread uh, effort to gain intelligence and I would assume that they would get some here. We're used to having them around us wherever we are. If we could turn to your potential opposition, how do you rate the Argentine Navy? Well, looking at their lineup, uh, they have a mixed bag of equipment. There's some which is quite old, but in many cases has been revamped. There is uh, other parts of it which are, are quite modern and much of the weaponry is modern European weaponry. They're a smaller navy than ours. They are probably quite a lot less experienced. We have the good fortune in uh, NATO and in the Northeast Atlantic to be constantly practicing with a number of uh, very expert navies. And uh, we have a greater opportunity than most to keep our skills at, at a high level. You have the advantage in as much as much of their equipment and some of their ships are British built. Yes, certainly they're British built. They're good when they're British built. So I don't call that an advantage, but at least we know quite a lot about them, that's for sure. You'd, you'd expect to have an, an edge over them, though, because of the training of your men? I think we go into this with confidence. Uh, I'm sure we'd acquit ourselves with honour. Uh, I wouldn't wish to run them down in any way, but uh, we are a very professional organisation. The equator provided another few light-hearted hours, necessary relief from all the work. The Navy likes crossing the line, and not even the prospect of war could keep them from welcoming King Neptune, who, as usual, abused the hospitality. With so many men aboard, scant ceremony or time was wasted on individuals. The novices were captured, smeared with the most appallingly sticky concoction, and dunked into seawater by the hundred. After a safe interval, a few hours later, more sedate ceremony greeted the arrival of Rear Admiral Sandy Woodward. Hermes, now the flagship of the fleet, sailed the last few miles to Ascension Islands. At dawn, the Harriers demonstrated their skills and their weapons. A smoke target in the sea was bombed and rocketed. The escort group lined up with the carrier to watch. Flashing low past the bridge, the Harriers took aim on a flare in the sky. Their heat-seeking missiles arced across the sky, momentarily brightening the target as they hit. pilots were enjoying themselves after two weeks hard work putting on a show for their audience until now the ships have moved with the full backing of the country what their officers fear most is a twilight period of waiting with a loss of momentum and a possible trickling away of political support the task force with all its power is ready Britain has gathered its might it must set its course 
That report was by Brian Hanry due to be scrapped in the next few months. But they and their crews are standing by for a reprieve and a new job. They're to be re-equipped with gear to drop conventional bombs over a long range. No one's yet saying where they're bound, just that the capability is being developed. The RAF had set up a demonstration protocol to show off that capability. It was bad luck that one of the three scheduled aircraft broke down, but the Vulcan remains a potent weapon. So great is the destructive power of these aircraft with their nine and a half tonne bomb load that the Vulcan option would only be used as a last resort. It may well be that they have been rescued from the scrap heap merely to provide a show of force. If that's the case, and that's something the Vulcans have been rather good at for 25 years. Now we turn to other news. It ...has just reached ITN. Film producer John Tippy and cameraman Steve Hackett were making a cinema documentary about what was to have been the last voyage of the Antarctic supply ship HMS Endurance and were on board when it was sent to South Georgia last month to investigate reports that Argentine scrap dealers had illegally landed there. For security reasons, they weren't allowed to film all that happened, but the material they did bring back is a unique record of what happened. Her Majesty's Ice Patrol Ship Endurance, on the seas around South Georgia, she, above all ships, knows best. For years, the mainstay of British activity in the Antarctic and well briefed to defend our interests in southern waters, capable of navigating through fields of icebergs to make herself invisible to enemy radar. Regular football matches made her crew and small detachment of Royal Marine Commandos welcome visitors in the Falklands. This was to be their last game before she sailed for South Georgia. Linesmen lost no chance to display their patriotism. Local spectators watched from a small fleet of Land Rovers, while other crew members braved the chill winds on the touchline, the British flag soon to be lowered by the Argentines fluttering behind them. The Marines collected their victory shield from Governor Rex Hunt and this message from the Islanders. One thing that's very important, you must come back next season and defend it. <laughs> But the Marines were about to try to defend much more than that. Rifles, Bren guns and other weapons came out for checking on the deck of Endurance as they were ordered to South Georgia where the Argentine scrap metal merchants had landed illegally. The Marines were preparing to go ashore to provide cover for their captain and an island official who were about to approach the scrap dealers and ask them to leave. The expected orders to do so never came from Whitehall and they sat for several days in Gritviken Harbour. While they were there, to everyone's amazement, there was an unusual arrival in the shape of a Russian tug which said it was coming in to stock up on fresh water. But she was also curious to take a look at how Endurance was equipped and whether she was accompanied by other ships. Question, why were the Russians so close or so interested at this stage? Did they know an invasion was imminent, or was it just a remarkable coincidence? At any rate, the Endurance's marines were left on shore to defend the Gritviken base if necessary, and Endurance herself was ordered to hear, head for the Falklands again, where British intelligence reports said an Argentine invasion was only two days away. She gave the slip to the Argentine ship Bayer Paraiso, shadowing her for several days. But it was only halfway to the Falklands when the islands fell. So Endurance was ordered back to South Georgia to help her marines counter the expected attack there. Her sailors mounted and tested her 20 millimeter gun and the anti-flash masks needed to use it. Ammunition stores with their AS-12 rockets were opened up and the rockets and their launchers were loaded onto the ship's WASP helicopters. We'll drop two Germanys off. Markings on the helicopters themselves were removed, names painted out, and the bright red colour replaced with black to camouflage them against the dark seas and mountains of South Georgia. As she headed back desperately to Gritviken, the British base commander there was already yeah, warning the Argentinians. Endurance, nicknamed Red Plum by its sailors, then tried to break in. The captain is negotiating with London at this moment on your behalf, over. But jamming by Argentina prevented Gritviken picking up the Endurance at this stage. And then the Biopariser's captain broke in, apparently thinking that if he let Endurance speak to Gritviken, she would order her marines to surrender. Endurance by 
here, but I also go over with your message, go over with your message to Gritpiken, to Gritpiken. He is listening in 11255. Uh, Gritpiken, uh, this is Endurance. I assume that you can hear me. Rules of engagement are uh, as stated earlier this morning. Rules of engagement are as stated earlier this morning. Defend if you are provoked. Over. Then, as the Argentinians attacked Gritviken, Endurance, now approaching a bay on the other side of the island, mobilized a WASP helicopter to go and see what was happening. Half an hour later, it was on its way back, its crew having landed just below the top of the mountain and scrambled up on foot to look at the Argentinian corvette limping away at the end of the battle. For Endurance's captain, it was quite a dilemma. Outside range, we're in fact a lot closer than uh, my directions uh, have allowed me to be. We're supposed to be some 150 or so miles away from South Georgia. We, as you look out, uh, are very close to South Georgia at the moment. Uh, I, my directive is not, regrettably, to go and zap the Parezo or the uh, Corvette, which we could well have done while they were both at anchor this morning off Leith, um, but that we should only fire, as I've said before, if we are provoked. Well, maybe we are provoking by staying here, and if we do provoke them, well, then we'll give them as good as we can. Get, we can. But instead, Endurance, with no military backup in sight, was ordered to slip away through the icebergs to take on fresh supplies hundreds of miles away. The dangers involved were well illustrated when this Wessex helicopter lost power in one of its two engines and had to dump its load to avoid going into the sea itself. And then Endurance, with the spirits of her crew high as usual, headed back south. The ship that was due to be scrapped now to join up with the rest of the British task force as they, pre as they prepared for today's Battle of South Georgia. Another civilian ship requisitioned for the Falklands task force has sailed for the South Atlantic. The container ship Atlantic conveyor has been converted into a small aircraft carrier. It's being used to ferry helicopters and sea harriers to the fleet. The 15,000-ton container ship Atlantic Conveyor had undergone conversion at Devonport Dockyard, a feat that took the yard force less than a week. She sailed out into Plymouth Sound as an aircraft carrier, ready to ferry planes and helicopters to the South Atlantic. At dawn today, she began to embark the first of the Wessex helicopters. A strengthened landing pad has been built on the ship's bows, with another on the stern. There are no facilities to move the aircraft down into the ship's holes, but the containers loaded with stores along each side will protect them from the weather en route. The Atlantic conveyor will also be transporting sea harriers. One of these jump jets carried out a test landing today. The Ministry of Defence has stressed that this ship will not be used as a base for operational flying. Her role will be just to ferry the aircraft to the Falklands force. It's thought that the operational sea harriers will join the Atlantic conveyor towards the middle of her voyage, possibly when she's off Ascension Island. The ship from the Cunard line is manned by civilians, but there are a number of service personnel now aboard. After this successful test by the Harrier from Yeovilton, and the Prime Minister Royal Navy to look after them is of paramount importance. HMS Antelope is one of the several ships in the role of guard ship, providing a screen against anything that attacks by air or from on or below the surface. She's modern, sleek, and like all the Type 21 frigates, powerful. On her decks are six torpedo tubes capable of launching a highly sophisticated warhead. She also carries the Sea Cat surface to air missile. There are other weapons, too, which the Navy doesn't want to disclose at the moment. But her main armament is her helicopter, known affectionately on board as Norman. The Lynx contains equipment to deal with the submarine threat, and she also carries the Sea Skewer air-to-surface missile. On the foredeck, a 4.5-inch gun. It's operated and fired automatically as information on the target is fed into the computers from the bridge and the control room below. The gun would also assist in supporting any landing assault with its rapid rate of fire.
impressed Liverpool as the Navy's 10th Type 42 destroyer. Built by Camel Laird at Birkenhead, she weighs 3,800 tons and can travel at more than 28 knots. Her main armament is the Sea Dart medium-range missile, but she also has a 4.5-inch gun and torpedoes. She'll carry a Lynx helicopter to launch anti-surface and anti-submarine weapons. Because she's the 10th in the line, obviously she has modifications which during a spell of about nine years have improved. We notice at the moment she doesn't carry the Sea Wolf missile. Is she capable of accepting that? Well, I imagine in any form of uh, necessity, we can always make room for anything. But uh, I have no plans and I have no knowledge uh, of any modifications to the ship as yet. Commissioning date, I understand, is in July. What else has to happen to her before she can go into active service? Well, as I said before, we have to, first of all, make quite sure the weapons systems themselves are tuned up. We've just come out of build. We're right on the ocean for the first time. And more importantly, that the men themselves are worked up and trained up to be a very good fighting ship. So there's a small path to tread before we reach that state. Is there any indication that that schedule may be brought forward? Well, there is, of course, a plan um, for this workup in normal times. I don't think it would be unreasonable for anyone to uh, believe that uh, you can always foreshorten anything.